It is March 2000. Elizabeth II is still our head of state, the final link in Australia's fading constitutional ties with Britain. She is a living reminder that Australia was created not as an independent nation, but as a dependency of Britain. One hundred years ago, this vast, ancient land existed as six British colonies. They were part of the British Empire and loyal to Queen Victoria. Australia was young, brash and democratic. The people had a vision of their nation and in the 1890s wrote their constitution. The colonies voted to create the Commonwealth of Australia and the six states. Never before had such small communities, divided by such distances, dared to form a nation. We were creating a better Britain, a classless Britain, a healthy Britain, back here in Australia. We kept the language, the literature, the law, the scepticism, but we threw out the class consciousness and class division. In early 1900, Australia's political leaders sailed to London. They went to win British approval for their constitution. A British Act of Parliament would unite the six colonies and establish the Australian nation. The people were nationalists, but they believed in empire. The fact that we saw ourselves an extension, a dominion of the British Empire, greatly influenced everything we did. This would be a nation of Australian Britons, a new nation for a new century. Australia was born as a child of the empire. Its people had the courage to vote for a new nation, but the common sense to realise that they still needed Britain. In 1901, Australia was not an independent country. Queen Victoria was head of state. The Privy Council was the highest court. We had no flag, currency or navy. Foreign policy, the power over war and peace, still rested in London. This program is the story of how Australia grew up with Britain, of our deep reluctance to break these ties, and of our slow march to full independence. Queen Victoria's representative, the first Governor-General, arrived at Farm Cove, Sydney, in December 1900. John Adrian Louis Hope, 7th Earl of Hopeton, came to inaugurate the nation. His new role of Governor-General was to protect and uphold Britain's interests in Australia. Hopeton was quickly the target of local jealousies. The wife of the South Australian Governor, Lady Tennyson, wanted somebody far grander. I think everyone feels that the position requires a much older man. In fact, a great statesman to set the wheels going in the right line and to keep peace between all the petty jealousies of the different colonies, especially Melbourne and Sydney, who have always hated each other. At 10 o'clock on the 1st of January 1901, Sydney began its celebrations for the inauguration of the new Commonwealth. Stretching from the Domain to Centennial Park, it was a mixture of Australian informality and imperial pageantry. Australia was an open-air democracy. It came into existence not in a hall or a parliament, but in a great park of the people beneath the summer sky.
100,000 people waited at Centennial Park. I, John Adrian Louis, Earl of Hopeton, do swear that I will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Victoria in the office of Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia. So help me God. Hopeton's accent was distinctly non-Australian. It would be 65 years before an Australian as Governor-General became the norm. The leaders of the movement for federation now became ministers in the first government. Edmund Barton, a Sydney barrister and a politician of charm and guile, was the first Prime Minister. His Attorney-General was Alfred Deakin, a Melbourne lawyer who would become the great Prime Minister of Australia's foundation age. The ministry was a mixture of liberals and conservatives. None was a Labour man. All states were represented. The bands played the national anthem. The soldiers gave the royal salute. Everyone in that living amphitheater stood and cheered again. It was a sight of a century. It was a sight worthy of an epoch. Five months later, the new nation would dedicate itself to the crown, the start of a long love affair. The Duke and Duchess of York arrived in the temporary federal capital, Melbourne. They came to open the new Commonwealth Parliament. It affords me much pleasure to convey to you this message from His Majesty. The Duke read the proclamation, extremely well worded, and everybody was surprised at the strong voice coming from such a little man. There was a profound silence all awed at this tremendously important moment for Australasia. But the bulletin was contemptuous of Queen Victoria's grandson. The opening of the first parliament of all Australia was an event large enough to stand alone. It wanted no tawdry trappings, no small accidental prince, a thin undersized man who has never done anything save be born, grow up, get married and exist by breathing regularly. I now his name declare this parliament open. Rule Britannia was sung. Lord Hopeton called for three cheers and the royal party left. The politicians made their way to Spring Street where the Commonwealth Parliament would sit for 26 years. I think in 1901, the majority of adult Australians believed that uh, they belonged to Australia first and foremost, but at the same time they were proud that they belonged to a larger organisation, the British Empire, which they regarded at that time as enormously successful, and an organisation they believed was essential for their own defence and safety. In the new nation, living standards were better than those of Britain. The average Australian had fresher food, a superior home, and lived longer. The population was close to 4 million, with 75% native-born. half the population still lived outside the capital cities and most Australians worked by hand. Motor cars were then practically unknown. Electric light had only just crept into use. The world famous beaches of Bondi and Coogee were ugly shores covered by bracken where boys went shooting. The banks of the Yarra were public tips. The word damn was not permitted on stage. Everybody went to church on Sunday. A good worker was passing rich on two pounds a week. And Victor Trumper was giving class bowlers a headache. 
Herbert Campbell Jones, the Argus newspaper. But Australia remained a British dependency and untested. It was created at the ballot box, not by war or revolution. Its spiritual birth would come 14 years later in the Great War. This was our greatest catastrophe. It killed 59,000 Australians and wounded another 167,000, about one third of all able-bodied men. Australians now proved themselves to their mates and to the world. Britain did not consult Australia before her declaration of war in August 1914. But Australia was bound by Britain's decision. Liberal Prime Minister Joseph Cook declared, Whatever happens, Australia is a part of the Empire, right to the full. Remember that when the Empire is at war, Australia is at war. The Australian people responded magnificently. Thousands rushed to volunteer. But families agonised over how many sons should go to war. The Menzies family was one of them. My father didn't go to the First World War, which was a continuing agony to him because he was criticised for it, and he felt he could never answer the criticism. But there was a family conference about it, and it was decided that Bob was the one with the brains and the ability, and he must stay at home and work and make certain the family was looked after. But I'm sure every time somebody in a public meeting called out from the audience, you didn't go to the war. I'm sure he felt it every time that happened. It would be nearly eight months before Australians faced their first battle on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Inside of a few hours, we shall be in the thick of the greatest combined military operation in history, with Australia in the pride of place. It is astonishing how light-hearted everybody is, whistling, singing and cracking jokes. Colonel John Monash. The landing was a military disaster. More than 7,500 Australians died in the Gallipoli campaign. Nothing will induce any of our staff to tell of the horrors they have seen and dealt with. And no one who has not seen it, in its awful reality, could imagine a portion of this saddest part of the war. Sister Lydia King. Out of the horror emerged a bond between the soldiers and a new pride in nation. For war correspondent Charles Bean, Anzac and mateship became synonymous with national identity. What was it that carried each man on? It was not love of a fight. It was not hatred of the Turk, nor was it purely patriotism. Life was not worth living unless they could be true to their idea of Australian manhood. Standing upon that alone, 
when the end loomed clear in front of them, when the whole world seemed to crumble and the heaven to fall in, they faced its ruin undismayed. On the anniversary of the landing, a crowd of nearly 100,000 gathered in Sydney's domain. It was the first in an Anzac ritual that would be repeated throughout the century. Labour veteran George Black was there. I shall never forget it. It was as though the crowd was swayed by a great wind and sobs and sighs went up on every hand. Then suddenly, somebody began to sing Abide with me Fast falls the eventide And the great crowd took it up It was one of the most emotional moments in my life We're still, people tended to think of themselves as much as, as New South Welshmen, Victorians and so on, as Australians. What, what did Australia mean? And it really hadn't gelled by that stage, but I think Gallipoli did a hell of a lot to, to gel into the minds of Australians that we were, uh, we were Australians. The Great War lasted four long years. It created a new sense of nationhood. But it generated a division over loyalty to Britain that Australia had never experienced. There would be a political war on the home front. The optimistic and naive pre-war Australia would now split between nation and empire. The hopes and divisions were embodied in one man, William Morris Hughes. Hughes was a founder of the Labour Party and a born war leader. As Labour Prime Minister, Hughes was immortalised as the Little Digger. He won the admiration of the Governor-General, Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson. The stone deaf. He is a remarkable personality. He's a natural leader of men, a delightful companion, bold in adversity, clear in his views. He is a most sincere imperialist. Hughes was convinced that Australia's future hinged absolutely on the British Empire winning the war. With a stalemate on the Western Front, voluntary recruitment was in decline. War casualties were mounting. Britain was cabling for more troops. Recommend that special draft of 20,000 infantry, in addition to normal monthly reinforcements, be sent as soon as possible to make good present deficit. Secretary of State for the Colonies, 24th of August, 1916. By 1916, Hughes decided that conscription was the answer. But his own Labour Party was passionately opposed. He demanded a referendum to have the people overrule Labour's objection. Every citizen must decide in which camp he will stand. For or against Australia? For or against Britain? For or against the Empire? Most of Hughes' support came from the Conservative side, the Liberal Party, the Protestant churches, business and the middle class. His opponents were the trade unions, most of the Labour Party, the working class Catholic vote and women. 
wives and mothers. Some women won't open their doors to a clergyman during that first war. I had four boys away, and when I hadn't heard from your father for some months, I used to stand at the side of the curtain, peeping out the corner of the window, so no one would see me watching the road. When the minister did come for me, three times he came. I knew each time which one of the boys it was. Hotels were closed on the day of the referendum vote. Hughes knew the result would be close. He just lost. The no case scraped in with a 70,000 majority. Hughes had confronted his party and lost. The caucus meeting on the 14th of November 1916 would shatter the Labour Party. It is now apparent that there are elements in the Labour Party with which in fact I have nothing in common, which in fact I hate and distrust. I am now worn with the storm and stress of a conflict, the most severe, the most bitter Australia has ever known. Labour members, once friends, had now become enemies. Hughes' opponents moved to depose him as leader. Hughes is out here and inherent in his treachery, in his attempt to force conscription. With the numbers against him, Hughes finally held up his hand. The room fell silent. Hughes walked out of the Labour Party forever. Those who are prepared to stand by the British Empire and to see the war through to the end, please come with me. Twenty-four Labour members followed Hughes. Having split the Labour Party, he then persuaded the Liberals to join him. Hughes won the May 1917 general election and formed a new non-Labour party, the Nationalists. In many ways, he stood up more strongly for what he saw as Australia's interests than almost any other Prime Minister in, in the next 60 years. But uh, e even that can be divisive in a, in a society that's torn between its loyalties to Britain and its loyalties to Australia. A re-elected Hughes was emboldened to hold a second conscription referendum. He sought support from a famous Australian. Dear Mr Hughes, I was very flattered to receive your cable asking me to send a cable to the women of Australia. I hope the reply was satisfactory. I tried to make it strong because Entree knew very few Australian women use their brains. And if only they would wake up and realize how much they can do to help their country in this appalling struggle and tragedy. Your sincere friend, Nellie Melba. This time, the battle was joined between the charismatic Catholic Archbishop, Dr. Daniel Mannix, and the Prime Minister. It was bitter and personal. The little Tsar of Australia would be a very proud man if he could address a meeting like this. 20,000 people came to Melbourne's exhibition building to hear His Grace. As you know, Boys of 20 will be driven to the trenches if conscription is passed. The question and issue is not a religious or sectarian one. It is an Australian question to be answered by Australian citizens. Archbishop Mannix, who has assumed the position of leader of the government's opponents in this fight, has preached sedition in and out of season. Australia's pre-war unity was being destroyed. That led to the divisions between Irish Catholic and other Australians, and indeed ultimately to all Catholics and other Australians, which never really 
died away till the middle or late 1950s uh, and left a scar on Australian society for several decades. The vote was on the eve of Christmas. The no case won again by a greater margin. Hughes had misjudged a second time. But the people were not voting against the war. They were voting against conscription. The conscription battle went to national identity. For the first time, Australians had to choose between loyalty to Britain and loyalty to Australia. That's why it was such a convulsion. But the bottom line after the war is that Billy Hughes prevailed. He won the elections. Australia was a divided but conservative country. Most people felt that we needed the empire to succeed and survive. True independence was still far off. In the 20s, empire rituals were cherished. Australia had a new Prime Minister, Stanley Melbourne Bruce. Bruce had one article of faith, that a strong empire would make a strong Australia. He also had a sense of his own dignity. Something of an exquisite, the most highly veneered politician we have yet produced. He wears immaculate clothes, has the stunning profile and the air of a ladies' home journal hero. Mrs B is among Dirac's most tastefully dressed matrons. Her mother was a manifold. There are no little bees, but a well-manicured dog does his best to keep the pair from feeling lonely. The stylish couple travel to London for the 1926 Imperial Conference. The opening dinner at Lancaster House was a glittering event. Eighty Empire statesmen attended the dinner. It was a colourful scene, fully expressive of the vast ramifications of the British Empire. The Daily News. But the blood sacrifice of the Great War had left its mark. At this conference, the old Empire would be buried. The more radical dominions wanted to be independent. They demanded equality with Britain. Canada, led by Mackenzie King, had just experienced a major constitutional crisis. In South Africa, the Boer War had left a fiercely anti-British people. Prime Minister Herzog was insistent in his demand for equality. The Irish Free State was riven by violent division over its ties with Britain. Australia had none of these internal revolts. Bruce saw Australia's security as being best furthered by Australia staying inside a strong empire. And in this, you know, Australia was going against the trend of Canada and South Africa and those countries that were, in a sense, uh, wanting to, to, to loosen the ties that bound the empire together. When the conference began, South African Prime Minister Herzog asked for a written declaration of equal status with Britain. Bruce saw this as utterly unnecessary. It would be disastrous to attempt to lay down something in the nature of a written constitution that is going to govern us in the future. It is quite impossible for an empire progressing continually as we are to have any such document. The empire was split. Britain's elder statesman, Lord Balfour, was asked to settle the dispute. Britain was wise enough to offer equal status to the Dominions. The result was the Balfour Declaration, which said of Dominions like Australia, They are autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, 
in no way subordinate one to the other in any aspect of their domestic or external affairs. Herzog claimed a great victory, returning to Pretoria a hero. The old British Empire, which existed in the past as a result of what the Imperial Conference has done, exists no longer. There were no cheering crowds in Australia. Bruce returned home to a new bush capital, Canberra. Bruce was not interested in independence for Australia. He played down the Balfour Declaration in favour of empire unity. The empire links were symbolised in the opening of the new parliament. It was again a royal event. The Duke of York, the future King George VI, presided against an Australian landscape. But Bruce would soon be replaced by a new Labour Prime Minister who would test how seriously both nations saw their new equality. The new Prime Minister, James Scullin, was an Irish Catholic, dedicated and homespun. He took the Balfour Declaration at its word, constitutional equality with Britain. Scullin wanted to appoint the first Australian Governor General. Cabinet feels strongly and unanimously that the Right Honourable Isaac Isaacs would be by far the most suitable appointment. Isaacs was the Australian-born son of a Polish Jew and a member of the first Commonwealth Parliament. Now 75, he was Chief Justice of the High Court. His credentials were near perfect. King George V was not pleased. He refused to appoint Isaacs. Scullin went to London to resolve the issue. The King's long-serving private secretary, Lord Stanfordham, met Scullin at Buckingham Palace. You have put a pistol to the King's head in that you have nominated one man and one man only, thus giving the King no choice in the matter. It is unprecedented. Returning to his Savoy hotel room, Scullin typed up the exchange. The King has received many letters and petitions vehemently and strongly protesting against the appointment of Sir Isaac Isaacs. Would you be prepared to take a referendum on the subject? Yes, and would, if necessary, be prepared to fight an election on the issue whether an Australian is to be barred because he is an Australian. The stalemate continued. Scullin was summoned once again to Buckingham Palace. This time, he was face to face with the King. It is now 30 years since I opened the Commonwealth Parliament in Australia. Since then, we have sent many governors, Commonwealth and state. Why make a change in the usual procedure? Scullin said there was an Irish precedent. The King, in effect, said that Ireland was a spoiled child. Does Australia, with her traditional loyalty to the throne, wish to be compared with Ireland? Where, alas, a considerable element of disloyalty exists. Scullin was unyielding. After a 45-minute battle, the king relented. I have been for 20 years a monarch, and I hope I have always been a constitutional one. And being a constitutional monarch, I must, Mr. Scullin, accept your advice. It established at that point that the King would act on the advice of his Australian government, not uh, according to his own personal whim 
or according to the advice of the United Kingdom government. The Crown of Australia was now constitutionally separate from the Crown of Britain. Installed in January 1931, Isaac Isaacs became the first Governor-General to reside permanently at Yarralumla. But having an Australian in the office was short-lived. The next Conservative government appointed an Englishman, Lord Gowrie, as Governor-General. The 1930s depression reinforced Australia's conservatism and conformity. Sunday lunch was a family ritual. Newlyweds lived with mum and dad. Censorship was rife. Aldous Huxley's Brave New World was banned in 1932. Everyone tuned in to the wireless. The Australian Broadcasting Commission relaying to the southern seas also on a short wave for world reception. We are now crossing to the Royal Empire Society's dinner at Sydney. Australians embraced their empire. They depended on Britain for finance, trade and security. 97% were of British Irish heritage. In 1931, Britain passed the Statute of Westminster. It formalized the Balfour Declaration. Britain was giving Australia its independence. When the whiter parts of the Commonwealth were let go by the Foreign Office, that's Australia, Canada, etc., under the Statute of Westminster, it was regarded here as not a freedom at all. But, you know, um, we were being unceremoniously kicked out of home and people here just didn't like it. In 1932, there was a new Conservative government. Father of 12, Joseph Lyons, was Prime Minister. The first member of the Cabinet I desire to introduce is Mr Latham. Lyons' Attorney General was John Latham, later to become Chief Justice. Latham campaigned against the independence offered by Britain. His arguments have echoed down the century. Few Australians have the illusion that Australia could maintain her existence as a completely independent state. Alone, Australia is weak. As a member of the British Commonwealth, Australia is strong. In practice, we in Australia have all the freedom we can possibly desire. This is remarkable. Britain was offering us independence and we didn't want it. The politicians didn't want it and the people weren't interested. The argument was similar to the 1999 Republic debate. The Conservatives said, the system works well, don't change it. Until the 1920s, the 1930s, when you had the Balfour Declaration and the Statute of Westminster was passed in 1931 to be adopted by Australia 11 years later, in 1942, Australia was not an independent nation. In 1935, a man destined to become Australia's most successful leader made his first visit to England. Robert Gordon Menzies was a child of a middle-class family imbued with its values. At last we're in England. Our journey to Mecca has ended. Dover. It has for centuries been the gateway of romance and high endeavors. I feel a tang in the air that mere state of wind or weather could not possibly create. Menzies was in his 40s when he first went to England, the land about which he'd read, whose poetry he'd read, whose law and history he'd studied. But in being a distant place, a place that one never confronts with real experience, it's possible for it to, in, in many ways, to be idealised. In London for the Jubilee of King George V, Menzies was welcomed by Britain's elite and its royal family. 
They are as natural as possible. I heard Margaret Rose bullying Elizabeth outside the door. Elizabeth displayed a comical capacity for acting. This is a real family with real and intelligent people in it. We leave walking on air. <laughs> his political life, Menzies would visit Britain, his trusty home movie camera by his side. His heart and soul were given to the British way of life. For Menzies, Australia's greatness lay in its British institutions and its British heritage. my melancholy duty to inform you officially. In 1939, when Britain declared war on Germany, Menzies was Prime Minister. Like Billy Hughes before him, he saw Australia's wartime fate as tied to the British Empire. Great Britain has declared war upon her, and that as a result, Australia is also at war. In England, Menzies praised the British people for their wartime courage. For Menzies, all the British people stood united. He always defended his 1939 declaration of war. My announcement expressed the overwhelming sentiment of the Australian people. In 1939, neutrality for Australia in a British war was unthinkable unless we were prepared to add secession to neutrality. But Menzies would not see the war through. He was forced to resign as Prime Minister in 1941 and in opposition had to devise an entirely new appeal. The time has come to say something of the forgotten class, the middle class, who properly regarded represent the backbone of this country. Using weekly radio broadcasts, Menzies appealed to middle class values the values of a British-inspired democracy and monarchy. The home, the foundation of sanity and sobriety. In the Forgotten People's Speech, Menzies makes the symbol of the home central. The things that really matter to people are their family relations and their children, their community engagement and involvement, and not necessarily just the economic conflicts of the marketplace. And he wanted to say to people against the way in which Labor constructed politics as a, a clash of class interests, that politics was really about values and principles. Newly elected Prime Minister Menzies with his wife and daughter Heather. Menzies won the 1949 election with a vision. Middle class stability, family values and the quarter acre block. A society united under the crown. It would be affirmed by a great event. And now, like a great seventh wave, the cheering grows to its climax. Into the forecourt of the palace and through the gates comes the gilded coach, two centuries old, bearing the young queen to her crown. When Queen Elizabeth II came to the throne, my father like the vast majority of Australians, thought here is this beautiful young queen at the end of a dreary, gloomy, sad war, and the whole world looked better because she was there. years after Federation, the young Queen became the first reigning monarch to visit Australia. The people turned out in their millions. She came as the living symbol of the unity of crown and people. It is therefore a joy for me 
who address you not as a queen from far away, but as your queen, and as a part of your parliament. Menzies' ardor for the crown was in harmony with the popular mood. The Labour Party was equally enthusiastic. We were essentially British, and you can find plenty of comments from Australian Prime Ministers about our British character, and plenty of comments of Australian cricketers going back to Britain as going home or going to the old country, but that we were creating a better Britain, a classless Britain, a healthy Britain, back here in Australia. During Menzies' long rule from 1949 to 1966, Australia was transformed. By the end of his term, authority was being challenged. A younger generation now raised its voice. Australian women are the only people who give a damn what colour knickers the Queen is wearing. The English don't care a bit. Queen made her next visit in 1963, Menzies' devotion was an anachronism. In the words of the old 17th century poet, I did but see her passing by, and yet I love her till I die. It was one of the few occasions, I think, on which Sir Robert misjudged his audience. And I can remember that there was a a frisson of embarrassment, and this was perhaps reflected in the Queen's own uh, uh, look on that occasion. Of sexy brow and mellow voice, a palace boy and God's own choice. Australians were claiming a more modern identity. The political symbol of this changing mood was Gough Whitlam. Britain and Australia seem to be drifting apart. Is that what you want? What do you mind? I want to modernise the constitutional arrangements, uh, and those, of course, are matters which I'll be discussing. And here is Her Majesty wearing a splendid, glittering gown. Whitlam proposed to naturalise the monarchy, to invest it with Australian ownership. The royal title became the Queen of Australia. She's wearing the famous Russian tiara, which is... She came to lunch at the Prime Minister's Lodge and uh, we had uh, uh, a senior trade union representative, Jack Edgerton, the Vice uh, President of the ACTU. Uh, so I introduced Jack Edgerton and he said, I believe you've been naturalised, love. And as I said, the Queen was amused. She'd become Queen of Australia. <laughs> Whitlam also sought to enhance the role of Governor-General. He appointed a distinguished Australian, Sir John Kerr. The new tradition of Australians as Governor-General had begun with Lord Casey in 1965. Kerr relished the ceremony and the powers of his office. He would prove, in spectacular fashion, that Australia was an independent country. This special news bulletin from the ABC is read by Peter Young. Mr Whitlam has been dismissed by the Governor-General and Mr Malcolm Fraser will become caretaker Prime Minister. John Kerr said the only solution consistent with the Constitution and with his oath of office was to terminate the commission of Mr Whitlam as Prime Minister and to arrange for a caretaker government able to secure supply and willing to let the issue go to the people. When Kerr dismissed Whitlam, the Queen was asleep in her Buckingham Palace bed. Her staff broke the news the next morning. Shocked is a, is a very strong word and um, the Queen was always very good at containing her emotions in, in circumstances um, which might well have shocked, amazed, surprised or enraged other people. It would be true to say that none of us at that time thought that this was an ideal solution to the crisis. 
Kerr chose not to inform the Queen in advance. He believed the dismissal decision was the Governor General's, not the Monarch's. I'm very surprised myself that he didn't take the advantage of her uh, long experience and consult her about what he intended to do. My own feeling is that she would have advised him to play out the situation a little longer. But the decision had been made in Australia. After the dismissal, the palace confirmed that the Queen had no role to play in Australian politics. I think one of the, if you like, unfortunate results, um, of which there were obviously many, of 1975, was that it, for all time, put the Queen outside the Australian political process. The relevant decisions made by the parties uh, that took place in 1975 in relation to that crisis were all made by actors in Australia. Very powerful proof that we were the masters of our own destiny. The Queen of Australia had no real power. The power resided in the Governor-General. Australia was a crowned republic. Fifteen years later, a new Labour Prime Minister saw this logic. It was clear to me when the Queen came to Australia in the first month or two of my Prime Ministership how inadequate it now was for her to attempt to represent all that we were. I mean, the Republic was an after-dinner mince and coffee conversation for 40 years. A political party has to champion these issues to make them live. It is insulting to the self-respect of Australia to say that we should abandon tradition and history in order... John Howard was a nationalist and a monarchist. He was the latest champion of an unbroken political tradition that ran back to Federation. Why are you a monarchist? Because I think the present system works. It's a reflection of my Burkean conservatism when it comes to institutions. But I'm not going to throw out something that's given us, helped to give us, uh, immense uh, uh, stability. In an historic meeting with the Queen in 1993, Keating advised her of his plan to make Australia a republic. Well, I saw her at Balmoral. We had a sort of convivial time. I think she thought there's an inevitability about it. And she said, well, of course, I'll always do what the Australian people think best. But Keating lost the 1996 election to John Howard. This is a proud moment for me tonight to lead back into government the Liberal Party of Australia. Three years later, the monarchist Prime Minister put a referendum on the Republic. It's time to become a Republic. That's obvious. How head of state should be one of us? Although the polls showed a majority wanted a Republic, Australians were split over whether the President should be elected by the Parliament or the people. Look, I've got two badges on. I'm a yes man and I'm a no man. Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> because I want a republic. One hundred years after Australians voted to unite Australia, another generation rejected its first chance to become a republic. It was a victory for the conservative tradition that has been so strong for much of this century. Looking back over 100 years, it's entirely unsurprising that Australians voted for the current system. Over the past century, Australia didn't achieve its independence in some dramatic or glorious event. Independence came slowly, often reluctantly. For much of its history, Australian nationalism and the empire have gone hand in hand. But Australia is no longer a child of the empire. Its future is its own. To determine what sort of independent nation 
it wants to be. In a moment, a look at 100 years for next week. The examination of our history continues on Radio National with 100 Years, the Australian story, heard Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock. And for more details, visit the website at abc.net.au slash 100 years. Stay with us now for Foreign Correspondent.